So I have the pleasure of introducing Marianne Bellotti, who I saw at Strange Loop in 2019, and she gave a great talk on TLA Plus, and I really enjoyed it. And so I was kind of trying to figure out, and I, told, I don't think I told you this, Mike, but I was trying to figure out a way to get her to Detroit Tech Watch 2020, and then, of course, Detroit Tech Watch 2020 kind of blew up. Right, yeah. <laughs> But then I, I said to her, I'd love to see a talk on TLA Plus. And she said, well, I've got something even more interesting. And she explained it to me. And I thought, wow, that is really cool. So I am just thrilled as I can be to have Marianne joining us to tell us about system dynamics. And so without any further ado, take it away, Marianne. Excellent. Uh, we can consider this like a little preview of uh, a future Detroit talk because uh, actually on my list of like places to go this year was Detroit. And I was very, very upset <laughs> that that had to be like basically canceled when the world shut down completely. So 2021, I guess I'm going to have to go to all those great American cities. I was going to go visit in 2020. All right. Just going to go to present mode and everybody see that. Okay. Great, excellent. Okay, and I'm also going to maybe attempt to use the chat at some point. So just be forewarned on the lookout. Uh, I may, I may, I may ask for audience participation at some point. But yes. So uh, my name is Marianne Bellotti, uh, and I'm here to kind of talk broadly about modeling computer systems, and specifically about this thing called system dynamics that I'm getting very, very deep into as of late. So a little bit about me to start off with. Uh, I have about five, 15, maybe bordering on 18 years in the software industry. Right now, I've sort of been kind of like half in, half out for a part of that. Uh, I kind of like jokingly, half snidely referred to as the technical anthropologist because a lot of my formal education is actually in anthropology. And I tend to be drawn to tasks within technology that are very much about like, looking at how organizations build things based on their structure and their culture and how that leads to their technical decisions. And uh, for much of my career, that meant that I was focused very closely on legacy technology, modernizing legacy technology. I have a first technical book coming out in March that I'm super, super, super excited about. So I had to plug that before we talked about anything else. Um, but like two years ago, I decided to come out of the, this very old space and kind of start experimenting with building new technology. And ultimately found out that it wasn't that dissimilar from the stuff that I had been doing, kind of looking at old, old technology. Um, because I was uh, still looking at complex systems. I was still looking at a really like complicated, distributed, uh, a lot of web-based systems like cloud computing and whatnot. But like there's so the same things that had been very successful in the old stuff also worked really well in the new stuff. So even though I tell people it looks like I've like pivoted in my career and I'm now doing something completely different, there's a lot of similarities and overlaps to what I've been doing, uh, especially for the last five years or so. So that was really nice to sort of discover. And I feel compelled to point out that uh, I did not plan this, but for some reason I am wearing one of my dumpster fire t-shirts today in celebration of um, complex system going, going terribly awry. And I say one of, because this is actually not the only dumpster fire t-shirt I have. I've apparently been collecting different dumpster fire t-shirts from different artists around the internet for, for a while. Um, anyway, so before I get into system dynamics, I wanna really just generally talk about the term model. Throughout this presentation, I'm gonna use model as kind of an umbrella term for a bunch of different concepts that have various names, depending on whether you're talking about technology that comes from a really heavily math background or from a different background. Um, a model, if you think about the various ways we use this term, is essentially an abstract representation of something. I guess some miniature that you use to sort of like figure out the orientation of something in architecture. Um, and in this case, we're really talking about software systems and modeling representing their interactions, how they work together and like connect together. 
Um, the significance of models in this context versus system diagrams is that we want models to be runnable, which means we want to be able to either um, run simulations on them, which is one way of building models to sort of say, like, here are my inputs, what would my outputs be, what would be the behavior of this system the way I have modeled it for you. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today also does things uh, called type checking, meaning that you, they're not interested in running a simulation so much as they are in verifying that your model is correct given the restrictions that you've given it. So uh, we'll get more into that in more detail very quickly. But in our ideal case, we wanna be able to have a model that's checkable, meaning that we can set some constraints. These things are true, these things are false. If these things happen, please throw an alert or an error and tell me that we've reached that, that point in our model because that's significant to me. So these are our ideal requirements when we're talking about model. And why model computer systems? Well, I think everybody, if you've worked long enough in technology, you've probably had a circumstance where there was some sort of bug in production, maybe a critical outage. And as you're going through the postmortem and the, the whole chain of events, you think to yourself, get to the root cause, you're like that super obvious now that I look at it. Now that I'm focusing right at it, like in hindsight, that was completely obvious. How did we let that get as far as it did? How did it stay as long as it did without anybody noticing? I think this is sort of a universal feeling, right? And the reality of systems is that you don't know what you don't know with them. A lot of the, the problems that we have with complex systems is that they, they are so complicated and so many moving parts that it's, it's impossible for one person to hold a picture of the system and its behavior in their mind and consider every detail in every scenario. So what's interesting about modeling computer systems is that a lot of these tools will give us the opportunity to explore these systems in different scenarios and really think about them critically in different ways. And that can lead us to discover unexpected behavior, how our expected behavior and our, our happy path cases can sometimes lead to completely legal, but totally unexpected and maybe even disastrous behavior. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that, that I'm going to talk about today focus on this idea of impossible states and like, are there any conditions in which these impossible states can occur? And I can't overemphasize how beneficial it is simply to define what an impossible state in a system that you're building should be. Like these are conversations that engineering teams don't generally have with one another and it's really great to facilitate this. What shouldn't this part of this system be able to do? What should the, the correct response be? And like, what is a valid response versus an invalid response? Once you start getting into those details with people, you start to see a lot of edge cases that weren't very obvious before. And it's really great to sort of stimulate that conversation as early on in the process as possible. So this is the audience participation part of the talk. Uh, from your experience, where has software gone wrong in the past? Like what, what has been the experience that you guys have had with software and failure? <laughs> Literally everywhere, correct answer. We have some unexpected inputs, didn't test well enough. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has perfectly functioning. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm speaking to like people who only build perfect systems that never have any failures. Didn't understand the system constraints. Nice, all right. These are, these are very smart answers. So now, now I'm doubly intimidated that, that I will be able to convey useful information. <laughs> So I'm gonna break down the types of unknowns that trigger failures in software into four categories and kind of go through each category with you and provide you with some tooling, some example tooling that we use to model systems with that specifically in mind. So the first is the one that people are the most kind of obsessed with, algorithmic correctness. Does your program literally do what you think that it does, right? Like. A plus B equals C, does that all work correctly? Or do you have some sort of bug in, in your logic and how you've arranged things? But then once we get that settled and we're, we're pretty much sure that our function does what we need it to do and what we think it does, then we have the issue that computers tend to like, you know, 
we could build everything single threaded, but we don't get very far with that. So we have it almost immediately, we have issues with parallel computer and, and concurrency issues. Like does the order of the operations that are in a, a particular workflow, does it matter? And like, if they appear in a different order or something is connection is dropped or delayed or whatever, does that change the outcome of the process in a way that is unexpected or undesirable? Um, then we have like relational issues. I, I put this in parentheses permissions because that's the, I think the, the most accessible example. When we're talking about relational issues. We're really not talking so much about databases. We're talking about hierarchies of permissions and types, right? So I'm gonna go into that in more detail. Hold on, hold on for a minute. Um, and then the last category are feedback loops. So let's start with our algorithm correctness. This is what, our function is supposed to do, does it actually do it? And does it actually do it for all possible inputs? And are there any undefined states? This comes into uh, the equation, especially when we're talking about uh, languages that verify program languages. Uh, you have a certain set of data structures and you have a certain set of functionality. And like with those combinations, do you ever end up in a state that you actually haven't implemented in your programming language? language. I've heard tale that this is super useful and eventually I have to learn how to do it because I'm in the process of sort of developing a toy programming language and so I will need to take responsibility and make sure that it is verified safe. Okay, so uh, a really popular tool for this in the community is a tool called COC. I kid you not, that is what it's called. It is French. Uh, someone told me that the the creators of COC called it that just to annoy American software engineers, but you know, like, good job on them. Um, and so COC is known as a proof assistant. And so what that means is that COC was originally developed for proving theorems, like mathematical proofs. And it's structured in the, the, that way with the assumption of we're writing mathematical proofs. Um, and proofs themselves are very long, complicated things to write. So very much like specking a system, getting all of the little detail you need to actually write a proof is a lot of work. So the advantage that COC has is that it's sort of a domain specific language where you can write what you want to proof in COC and it can sort of fill in the blanks and do a lot of that work for you. Um, what's really neat, and the reason why this is popular in, in software among certain groups of people, is that it has this thing called program extraction, which means you can write a proof in COC, you can verify it, and then you can exact, basically compile it to OCaml, Haskell, I think it does Scheme as well, it might do something else now, I'm not sure. Uh, it kind of does C in a reverse engineering sort of way, meaning that I believe what the tool for C actually does is you give it some C source code and it will write the proof for you and let you kind of play around with it, that proof and um, iterate on it in, in, in their IDE environment. So that's kind of cool. And when you're writing your, your theorems that you're trying to prove, you're really thinking about things not in terms of like, does this, this set of inputs work and produce this set of outputs, but do all possible inputs, like all natural numbers? Do, does this function work for all natural numbers, right? And that's really kind of hard for people to conceptualize at first, because when we first say, okay, we have addition, um, this function is gonna add two numbers together. How do we write a proof proving that it works for all possible inputs? People immediately think, okay, so it's like a giant unit test where we go two plus two equals four, do we get four? Uh, two plus three equals five, two plus on and on and on and on. And that's really not what you wanna do. That, that would just be insane. And also numbers go up to infinity. You'd have a program that never ends. So what it, how does it do this? How does it look at these, these questions in terms of like all natural numbers, all possible inputs when the possible inputs for some of these functions are in fact in, infinite, right? And then it does it with types. It does it with types. So if you're not familiar with type theory, I'm gonna give you a 30 second primer on type theory, which is that types are basically a set of logical rules. When we call something an int or a Boolean, what that means is that we have programmed in a set of true false rules basically about what it can and cannot do. Um, and generally we've programmed that into the compiler. 
right? Uh, although depending on your type of language, there's probably a little bit of logic also in the evaluation of it as well. So this would be the core dis difference between um, static, strong, and, and um, dynamically weak typed uh, type languages. So the, oh, let me ask you something. Can we do the following little equation I put here? We have an int plus a float. Is that okay? Can we do that? And you can unmute yourself. At least I think you can unmute yourself and sort of jump off and say yes or no. I think it depends on the language, don't it? Some languages automatically do coercion. Yep, that's 100% correct. It depends on the language. Some languages will let you do this operation. They'll do it. They'll do the, the, the conversion for you. Some languages will not let you do this operation. Some languages will say, okay, you can do this operation, but I've got a built-in function that really needs, everything needs to be an int or everything needs to be a float. And this is the, these are the examples of the sort of logical rules we're talking about. That's really what we mean when we say a type. We're talking about a little logic program that says like, this is, what this data is, and this is what this data can do and what it can't do. So what COP does is it basically creates a set of logical rules for your functions and then compares them to each other and put fills out the little logic puzzle. And like, it's like, almost like a game of Sudoku, right? It goes, these things must be true. And these things also must be true. And like, here's my game board and does everything match up or is there a route of logical rules that conflict with one another? And like, this is, if this feels like kind of a steep learning curve, like, yeah, this is, this world is, is very, very, it's very hard to break into this, this world. This is what we refer to broadly as formal methods. And it, it's partly that the language that people use to articulate and teach these concepts is very heavily rooted in uh, academic math like university level math, which for many people is, you know, they took math in high school and for promptly forgot everything about it and like aren't really comfortable with all the Greek symbols as well. And uh, partly it's because the tooling available for these, these languages is not the most user-friendly. And then partly it's because the connection between these languages and like everyday programming languages like Ruby, Python, Java is always not super great. Like, so, Cop will compile to a camel and somebody put in uh, the chat, like, what is it, Rust now? I wouldn't surprise me at all if, if uh, there was a, you could compile Cop to Rust as well, because Rust is, is very, very swanky like that. Uh, that would be the closest that Cop has gotten to touching what people actually professionally program. Sorry, I know somebody's going to yell at me about how, like Haskell and OCaml being like the thing they build all their stacks in, but like you, I, God bless you, but you're in the minority of programmers. <laughs> okay, so that moves us on to concurrency, right? So this idea of like, what happens if we have um, functions that are formally verified, but they have a certain amount of steps and we do the steps in the wrong order. And uh, generally speaking, when we're working with a, con a concurrent system where this might be an issue where we might have race conditions or things like that, we we know this, we're aware of this and we're like, no problem. I've got some controls that are gonna keep this from being a problem and they're gonna make sure that everything happens just perfectly all the time. And so these are a set of languages that are really geared towards testing to see if your controls are actually likely to work, right? And so the example I really love about the, the types of problems that we, we would address in these kind of languages is uh, overdrawn bank account. Should you be allowed to withdraw the money that you maybe do not have in your account? And so TLA plus, which we mentioned already uh, tonight is a great example of a language that's very specifically desi designed for this. And what you do with TLA plus is you just define your algorithms in a series of steps. And then you set these logic rules as constraints. Um, this must, this state must always be true. Um, this state must never be true. Uh, this will be eventually true. And uh, then you can get a little bit more complicated with your logic rules as you get better with work first order logic. Uh, the struggle is real. Uh, and then what it does is it essentially runs through a scenario, uh, trying to find every possible step of that particular model to see if there are any steps that violate the logical constraints that you have defined. So that brings us to relational. And so uh, best example of relational is fine-grained permissions. If you think about 
the what the policy uh, server for Google Drive must look like. And there's actually a paper where you can see what it looks like. But the level of complexity around something like Google Drive, you have your files, then you have files that are in folders that you've shared with other people, then you have files that belong to an organization you're a member of, then you have like read access versus write access versus comment access. This gets very, very complicated really really, really quickly. And some of those rules, those groups and roles have an inherent structure. They're inherently hierarchical. Like I am in this organization. So I'm like a child of that particular organization and all that gets really complicated. And when you start putting those different rules together, do you end up with these little holes, like these little edge cases where somebody can access something that they shouldn't be able to, that they can see some type of data that they shouldn't be able to get access to. So looking at sort of relational models, being able to look at like this connected to this and how it's connected and like what the rules are that govern it. And then running all the various combinations of that can sort of help you sort of figure that out. Um, I actually really use this type of modeling a lot when I'm developing data schemas with engineering teams, particularly like really complex ones that involve a lot of different data uh, tables that have to be joined in various ways because uh, a lot of times we don't we don't imagine every conceivable circumstance so for me to be able to say like okay we have a user and a user has a photo and so we have kind of one entity that's a user and one entity is a user pick and then one entity is like I don't know, an email address then what will what will happen when I model in these languages is it'll give me every valid combination of those relationships that it can come up with. And so as a result, I'll get to just toggle through and say like, is this a valid state? Can a user have no user photo? And if the answer is no, then we know we have to add that condition to what we're building, right? Can a user have multiple photos? Can it look like this? Can it look like that? Can they have three emails and like, you know, whatever. Um, and so like you, you get to a lot of edge cases that people haven't really considered and leads to a lot of really interesting conversations. So I really love doing it when we're like actually developing a data schema for things. And a lot of times we end up kind of talking about system to system interaction with this kind of modeling as well, because that can have be represented in sort of a relational way. And the language that's really good at doing this is called Alloy, which is the single most obnoxious thing to call a language if you want people to be able to Google it. So, <laughs> um, I would say that that uh, if there is a, a wonderful uh, reference guide for Alloy that is a free on the internet, and so you might have to Google Alloy formal methods uh, instead of Alloy because if you put Alloy into Google, you'll get nothing but like pipes and like chemistry sets and like all sorts of stuff, which is not what you want. So. What Alloy does is it gives you the ability to define a relationship between different types. And then again, you make assertions using first order logic with those uh, about those various relationships. And then what Alloy does is it sits on top of an SMT solver. Uh, if you've never used an SMT solver, you don't know what that means. You can basically think of it as a uh, program that does logic puzzles. Uh, the first thing that people tend to do is like a hello world this is a Sudoku solver. Like again, set of rules, set of uh, elements, match all of the rules to their elements. So a, a SMT solver will kind of do those kind of calculations really quickly, well, normally quickly anyway. And so my last category is the one that I hope we're gonna spend the most time on today. It's called feedback loops. And the reason why I find this the most interesting is that a lot of practical tech problems actually look like feedback loops, right? So um, just some incidences that I've either participated in or kind of gotten the download in after the fact. Um, we had a situation where our load balancers were configured to check a particular endpoint as the health check and somebody removed that endpoint. So as a result, we had a load balancer that kind of went rogue, just randomly killing servers all over the place and then spinning them back up and then killing them before they could get into the pool because it thought it was unhealthy and it wasn't at all. Um, that's a feedback loop, right? Uh, we had a problem last year with uh, someone had changed the configuration of our lambdas so that they were timing out before they finished a particularly large job. And so as a result of that, 
the database wasn't committing the uh, the updates to it. So it was rolling them back and then the Lambda was restarting and doing them again and then rolling them back and then again and again, like over and over and over again. And the database was very unhappy with that uh, particular outcome. And, and so on and so forth. Like the, the significant part of these examples is that in nine, none of these cases is the action itself problematic. I want a load balancer to kill an unhealthy server. I want uh, a database to roll back a transaction that has terminated before I, I have actually committed it. I want like message queues to retry, but they become problematic when put in contact with other interactions that are currently going on in the system, right? And so like that, that leads us to the thing that, that took me a really long time to understand when I started doing this kind of modeling, which is that there's a really big difference between impossible versus undesirable. And a lot of the languages that I have mentioned uh, previous to feedback loops. So ALO, ITLA plus, COC. You, over and over I've talked about types and I've talked about first order logic. And they're built on these concepts because what they're really looking for is impossible states. They're looking to verify that a program with all, in all such circumstances, in all inputs will produce the correct output. So there, what you're really building when you write a model here is you're telling the, uh, the language, these are the things that should never happen. And these are the impossible states and prove to me that I'm wrong. Um, but a lot of software engineers, that doesn't like, that isn't a really big concern. A lot of the problems that software engineers face are problems with undesirable states, not impossible states, because we don't generally write our own you know, databases, right? We don't generally write our own infrastructure or like load balancers. We don't write our own routing logic or anything like that. We use open source solutions. We leverage the work of other engineering teams. And so most software engineers are either doing CRUD type stuff or they're doing workflows type stuff. They have a series of technologies that they're connecting together and kind of pushing bits back and forth between. And this kind of creates a different set of problems. You have a small number of impossible states in those, those types of tasks, but a large number of undesirable states. And so let's get on to, to system dynamics. Well, system dynamics was developed by a uh, computer scientist by the name J. White Forrester. And um, he is known for developing magnetic core memory. And um, because he, of his work on ma magnetic core memory, also laying the foundation for RAM, uh, he has all of these prestigious awards. Like he was from like this, the glory days of uh, computer science, the, the 50s into the 60s, the very early days when everything was new and the machines were the size of entire rooms. And so the, the sky was the limit in terms of like, being able to lay that foundation and do interesting stuff. So much so that around 1956, he sort of felt like he'd reached like the, the limit of what he could do in the CS space. He's kind of bored with it and wanted new challenges and new problems. Um, and so he had prior to this point been in, heavily involved in what was called the cybernetics movement in MIT. Cybernetics, by the way, is how where we get the term cyber from. And there's a really funny story about how it went from being this mathematical discipline at MIT to just being this buzzword of the internet. But essentially, it just comes down to a bunch of academics kept using this word cyber, and then a bunch of like artists on the internet thought it sounded cool and associated it with the internet, and then just became a shorthand for the internet as well. But the cybernetics movement was essentially about the study of communications and feedback loops, like how does, how do all systems, regardless of whether they are technical or non-technical, like communicate with one another through feedback loops. So he coined the term system dynamics and he basically thought of it as like control theory for economics. And the reason why he got there is because as he was looking for like something different to do because CS was boring and he had solved all the hard problems, um, those were his words, which I find endlessly amusing. Um, he, he started doing this work with uh, General Electric and General Electric came to him and said like, look, 
we either have too much inventory or too little inventory. Can you please, like, I think they were probably expecting that he would build them a computer that would just tell them how much inventory they should have of any one thing and solve all their problems for them. I think that was probably their motivation behind it. Uh, that was not what they ended up with. Because what happened is when he looked at their data, cumulatively across their, their uh, couple years worth of data, what he realized is that there was a pattern here that he recognized from his, the earlier stage of his career where he had been mainly working with the DOD during World War II, where um, what we'd see is that a cannon would like say, shoot too far to the right and miss the target and then overcorrect and shoot too far to the left. And then a lot of its uh, early caliber in the beginning of a battle would be going like too far right and too far left and too far right and too far and like until it got to the point where it was mainly going to hit the target. And so you recognize this and like this was a problem he had solved when he was working at the DoD. So he thought like, well, you know, we use control theory to solve this problem. So why can't we just use a control control theory in manufacturing? And so what control theory is, is this idea that you environmental forces respond to changes and need to be factored in to your calculations on uh, like how much force you use. So you have counteracting forces that will limit or restrict change and you have intensifying forces that will amplify the change. And a good example of that is if you think about steering a ship, right? If you want to delegate the steering of a ship to something mechanical or digital, you have to ca calculate in the force of the waves and the force of the wind, because these are things that are going to affect how much you have to steer the ship in order to get the correct amount of movement. It's not the same thing all the time. It depends on those external conditions. And you can do this in, in when you're talking about steering ships and aiming cannons, because those uh, forces are known and reasonably calculable. We can put sensors that tell us approximately what the wind is doing, what the waves are doing, all the, those factors. And we can get close enough that uh, it, it gives us utility. Like we can have a reasonably good calculation that is accurate and, and gets the job done, right? But when you start talking about things like economics, Right. How much force is in raising the prices? Like we understand that if you raise the price on a product that fewer people will buy it and therefore that will affect your inventory. But how much force is in that price range? It varies, right? It varies based on like what it is you're selling and how much people think they need it. Uh, it varies on how much you're raising the price. And it's, there's not really a good calculation for that. Like you can't really put a sensor out there and kind of go, okay, this is how we, we calculate those, those forces going back. Um, and on the side that's kind of more relevant for our modern concerns, how much load is a single page view? This again, like in theory, we have like enough, if we have good observability and good monitoring, we could probably calculate this. But it also varies by a lot of different conditions that may make it difficult to calculate, right? Like if we're in a healthy, well-functioning engineering team where we're shipping code daily, like maybe multiple times a day, then that exactly how much is being downloaded from a single page view may vary. Uh, it also varies depending on whether you hit the cache or you hit at a time or the cache is expired. So this is a difficult thing for us to calculate. And so as a result, he was like, all right, well, let's take the idea of control theory and simplify it a little bit and see if we can still get value. From it. So he started building out these system models based on these two very simple abstractions, a stock and a flow. And a stock is a unit of something, like you think of it as like a stockpile of something, and a flow is a rate in which the stock is either leaving or entering that stockpile, so an inflow or outflow. And the classic example of this that people always start when they uh, are explaining system dynamics is a bathtub, right? If you turn the faucet on, the water the flows into the bathtub at a certain rate, starts to fill up the bathtub. If you plug, unplug the drain, the water flows out of the bathtub at a certain rate and starts to decrease. Uh, whether or not you end up with a bathtub that's overflowing or uh, a bathtub that reaches kind of a, a homeostasis point or uh, an empty porcelain tub with water just running directly down the drain depends on how efficient your drain is and how good your water pressure is, right? So this is the way we think about uh, systems and system dynamics. And it's super, super simple, but actually you can 
it has a lot of flexibility in that sense of simplicity and you can represent a lot of different things in these types of models. So about a year ago, I started thinking about using this construct for technical systems, going back to that problem of like, what I build on a daily basis is not like, not based on algorithms that I am implementing myself or like these really, I'm not building a database, I'm using a database kind of a reality, but I still would like to be able to look at the system that I have and represent it in some way and like reason about it and run different scenarios on it. That's still desirable to me. So I started experimenting with using system dynamic for technical systems because I could sort of conceptualize how we would think about this in stocks and flows. Like a stock could be um, the amount of CPU I have or memory or data or requests and flows could be things like inserts, retries, exports, loading pages, so on and so forth. And what was particularly attractive to me about systems dynamics is the idea that I think it, more than the other forms of modeling that I tried, it allowed me to represent complexity and coupling uh, more easily and more intuitively within the model. And so that's significant because the type of failure that I'm really interested in is that type of cascading failure. Um, basically every AWS adage that you've ever experienced, right? It's never started in terms of like, well, I, I shouldn't say never, I'm sure there's like one or two, but it's not a lightning bolt comes down and hits a data center and like Amazon's data center is on fire. It's like, generally speaking, someone fat fingered a command somewhere and then updated a thing, which then updated another thing, which then updated another thing, which then took down all of AWS, right? Their most recent one was what they had, they had changed, um, something on their containers or something like that. But I kept reading over and over and kind of experiencing in my own technical life, like these really, really painful incidents that came down to these tiny, tiny little things, like tiny little um, monkey's wrench thrown into the, the works. And so I started like really reading into cascading system failure. And one of the best um, resources for talking about system failure is the work of Charles Perot. Uh, he wrote this book in particular called Normal Accidents, where he took a bunch of grad students and basically they did in-depth case studies of catastrophic failures on critical systems like nuclear power plants and uh, petrochemical processing and um, medical biotech and like all sorts of different types of systems. And one of the conclusions he came to is that the systems that were the most prone to failure had two elements that were really strongly represented. They were extremely complex. They had a lot of moving parts. No one person could understand what every part of the system was doing. And they were also really tightly coupled. So when thinking about these concepts, um, I want you to think about coupling as the role of dominoes, right? What coupling means is that when there's a change in one part of the system, there is a change in another part of the system almost instantaneously. Like there's almost no time to like prevent it, that they, they are tightly coupled together. And if there is time to fix it, then we say that they're decoupled or loosely coupled, right? So you that image of like, I hit that row of dominoes, the first domino fell over and the second domino fell over and the third domino fell over. It's very difficult to stop at domino five and go like, no more. No more dominoes are going to fall over. So that's tightly coupling. And then complexity is these many moving parts uh, working around. And what was interesting to me from the perspective of legacy modernization is that one of the things that I realized that these two characteristics are actually kind of a trade-off of one another. They're, they're linked. They're, they themselves are linked because the big thing that we do with legacy modernization is breaking up monoliths. That's kind of like the, like, that's always the first task is we have this really old system and it's too big and we need to break it up into smaller systems. But when we break things up into smaller systems, what do we do? We add more pieces to them. So we decouple them, but we also add things like, oh, we put some load balancers in and we put some API gateways in and we put some more moving parts here and some more moving parts here. And so it became very clear to me when I was working on legacy modernization that you could never have a state where you had a perfectly loosely coupled system and a perfectly simple system that you were gonna have a certain degree of complexity and a certain degree of coupling in your system by default. And the really big challenge was 
where are those two characteristics? Does it make sense for that system to be either coupled in that way or complex in that way? And if not, how do we get it? What would make sense and how do we get it there? And so what's really interesting about this is that the system dynamics community, which by and large are not computer people, they're mostly policy people, which is really interesting. There are a lot of people who are from like an environmental sustainability focus. There are a lot of people, I, we were saying before that the uh, system dynamics con uh, conference for 2021 has an entire track of COVID-19, right? Just devoted to COVID-19 models. So by and large, the system dynamic people are policy people. And so when I started getting, digging into it, like this year I decided to reread uh, Donna Summers, uh, Sorry, Donna Menor's Donna Summers, <laughs> Donna Menor's Thinking in Systems uh, book because it'd been a while since I read it. And when I was rereading it, I realized I, I hit upon this quote that she has in her books where she talks about stocks and flows. And she says uh, that stocks are the thing that decouples two parts of a system, right? The, uh, the inflow and outflow are decoupled because there's a stock in the middle and then it allows them to be uh, in, independent and out of balance with one another. And that was a really interesting insight to me that it, depending on how you built your system, you could uh, uh, decouple, represent it as coupled or decoupled or complex or uh, simple, depending on how you arranged and wrote the spec. So I'll give you an example. My hello world when I'm modeling is always a load balancer and a pool of VMs because it's relatively simple and I can think of the failure case and I can think of the successful case and I can sort of envision it really clearly and I find other people can as well. So I can create, I can think of this in terms of system dynamics by thinking our stock as a pool of VMs. And so it has two values that it's storing. It's storing the total capacity, so total CPU uh, utilization of all of the VMs in the pool. And then it's storing the number of VMs that are in the pool. And then our inflows and outflows are our requests coming in to that pool looking to be served and our response, basically our served pages back. And so I can now take this model and, and give it some numbers. I can say that like our incoming requests, um, every time a set of requests come in, we're adding 10% uh, additional CPU. And every time we're serving it out, we're adding, we're taking away 2% per number of VM that's in the pool. And now like these numbers are made up, but they're, they're made up to sort of give us an example, right? And I can also say that an additional piece of logic we want is that we know that uh, the behavior rural load balancer, when we start to get over a certain amount of capacity, we will add more VMs to spread the work around. So we can add a little bit of additional logic and say, like, well, if our capacity is over 70%, we want to add more VMs, right? And so uh, when I built this model, something very interesting happened uh, as I was running and playing around with it. So I started it with, okay, we have three VMs in our pool and 50% utilization of CPU. And so the first step increased by 10%, second step decreased by three times two, that's six, so decreased by 6%. Goes on very orderly and predictably, but we get up to like you know, step seven or state change seven, and now we're at 72%. What should step eight be? should step eight be 66% because we've gone down by 6% or 64% because we've gone down by 8%. And so there isn't real, oh, sorry, whether or not, like whether it's 66 or uh, <laughs> what the answer is really depends on how you structure uh, the flows, how you think about this model. So the first set of code, and this is really kind of pseudo code um, that I have on one side shows them coupled where we have one flow that changes two stocks. So if we look at the load first and then go, oh, we need to add another VM because it's over 70, then what we will end up is four VMs and then four times two is eight. And then we end up with the lower number. But if this is decoupled, then let's, we can have a scenario where uh, we look at the, we do the, um, the outbound traffic before we look at the load. And so we 
only we end up with a larger number because we will update it after we've sent out the the uh, sorry the traffic for that that step. And I circled this at the 66%, which seems to imply that it's like the right answer, but it's not really the right answer. It's just the most useful answer. Because if you think about how a load balancer works for real, it doesn't immediately know, oh my God, we are over the CPU utilization. Like, let me respond instantaneously. It can't, it takes time to spin up a new server and like make sure that all the health checks pass and get it out of the door. So you do tend to see a little bit of a delay when it gets over those limits that you have set for it and it needs to stand up more VMs and a little bit of delay when it's actually now okay and can shut down some of those VMs. So by uh, manipulating the amount of coupling and where the coupling is, I actually ended up with a model that really uh, accurately represented the behavior of the system I was looking to re represent. And that made me really happy, right? I could write the code differently and have that 64 number but that would not have given me the behavior that I was looking for. Okay, so the, what this like kind of leads me to is that I kind of like what people do when they're trying to build system dynamic models is um, they use a set of proprietary tools or they, they write their own models from scratch, which is, I won't say difficult, but annoying. Right, so they write their own models from scratch in Python or in R, um, and I didn't want to do that. I was really interested in uh, whether or not I could increase adoption of this kind of technique by making it easier for people to build these kind of models. So I started this with my pandemic side project. Some people baked banana bread. I decided to write a programming language. So I mean that 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 says things about me, I think. But, <laughs> Um, it, this is a project called Fault. It's like very, very, very pre-alpha. And what this is, is essentially building a domain-specific language that will help you construct a, a system dynamic model in stocks and flows uh, and then run it. And I have great ambitions for it in terms of type checking and all these fancy bells and whistles. And if you'd like to check it out, like this is a, a thing that's on the internet now. It's very, very early uh, manifestation. I am what I'm working on now is basically trying to figure out if the way the syntax I've used and the grammar that I use makes sense to people, and if it's the best possible uh, grammar going forward. And once I get that interface kind of straightened out, I'll probably move further with like making it a real thing. But you can definitely like, it has a little REPL, and you could definitely play around with it um, if you'd like. Uh, and then the, the more interesting thing is that I actually decided, well, if I'm going to go and do this, I need to like keep myself accountable to it. So I also am going to do a podcast about this like journey of learning how to write programming languages and what that's all about. And I think that's way more fun and interesting than the rest of it. But like that's also on the internet now. I'm on a little bit of a research break, but we'll, I'll be starting up again, posting new episodes. So like I talk about like how all this stuff works and like how I and learned about it because it was very overwhelming at first. And what's interesting to me about like writing a language to do these things is that as I kind of built models in different languages, the thing I keep coming back to is that I don't really care about every possible state. I care about likely states. And so there's a, a, a research paper out there about uncertain data types, which is essentially a data type that rather than and holding a number holds a, a distribution, a normalized distribution, a range of numbers, if you will, and allows you to kind of look at the probability of something happening. And that really fits what I'm trying to accomplish with these type of models really well. I am super, super interested in resilience. I am interested in like, if I add these kind of extra levels of complexity to my system, will that make the system more resilient, more fault tolerant, or will it actually add the complexity, making it ultimately more prone to failure? Like we all had experiences where we put something in thinking that it's going to be a control, it's going to save the day, and then the control fails. And then like all hell breaks loose, right? It takes down something you never thought about. And like, that's a very interesting scenario to me. And so I feel like if I can incorporate a little bit of probabilistic programming into this language, then I give people the ability to express uh, likelihoods and uh, kind of look at the tolerance that this system has overall for changes, uh, one variable versus the other. 
And then of course, I would love to get it to the stage of like asserting and doing model checking as well. So that's super exciting. Okay, so that basically concluded all my formal talk. I would love to like stick around and chat with you guys. You can, if you wanna follow my work, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Medium, like I definitely talk about like what I'm working on. I would love to have you join the conversation. Thank you, Marianne, that was awesome. I always, I love these kind of talks where I learn something. Yes. Um, just so we can try to keep, you know, from talking over each other, because I'm sure there's a few questions. Uh, you notice on the bottom of the screen, there's reactions and uh, there's a raise hand there. If you want to raise your hand or put something in the chat so that we just like say just we try to avoid talking over each other so that Marianne can hear everybody. Um, I think I see something in the chat now. I think maybe. Jessica has her hand raised. Ah, someone has their hand raised. Yep. I can't see who's got their hand raised. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jessica does. Take ah, it away. All right. Marianne, will you show us your programming language? I mean, right now? <laughs> yeah, why not? Your screen is shared. Okay. All right. You, you, you talk me into it. <laughs> you gotta, like, you got to warn me if you're going to make me do live coding. I'm going to edit presentation mode. I'm going to go to. All right, cool. So I'm gonna, there's actually like a whole documentation part that's up top. Like it's super pretty, but it's really intended to be docs. And my computer is behaving a little slowly probably because I'm screen shaving, it's sharing right now. Um, otherwise I would, I would toggle through and show you. Let's see if I can toggle through and show you. Maybe, maybe not. There we go, okay. And it, like at various points, it'll give me the option to kind of like go down for more detail and stuff like that. So you can kind of go through and see. I noticed the other day that I had some typos in my docs. So that's on my list of things to fix, but what can, what can I do? Um, <laughs> so this is the model of the load balancer that I was talking about. Like what should its behavior be and how does it look? So I am like basically looking at things as representing them as, as like objects like this, where you get to add some metadata and um, then give a stock of value and give a flow of function that determines how it executes. And what this does is it's like a giant loop, right? You can define how many times it runs by, in this REPL by default, it'll run for five steps um, and it will go through and find all of your flows and execute all of your flows one after the other. And it will mainly execute them in the order that you define them unless you tell it to do something different. So when I click the run model button, it will like first run the model, but then it will also, so this is cool. There's a language called dot that does kind of flow, flow charts and stuff. So I was able to take you know, one of the things that the JavaScript compiler does is it parses your spec and it figures all the stocks and flows that are connected to one another and it writes it in dots so that you can have this little visualization. Because the thing that I learned when I was writing a lot of alloy is that what I think a spec means and what the computer thinks a spec needs are often very different for the first couple of slides. <laughs> so having that visual feedback of what the computer thinks these things are connected together is really useful. I think I'm going to figure out how to get that to stick around in the, in the language when it's ready to be released in its alpha. But yeah, like the, the, I will post the link to this little mini site in the chat and like, please feel free to sort of play around with it. I get kind of like a little uh, record of what everybody has put in this, this code editor. So even if you write a, a spec that completely does not work, that's still super useful for me because I will play around with it on the, the backside and figure out if you found a bug or, or what. It's great data. All right, who's emceeing and calling on people? Uh, Ryan, why don't you, since you can see who's got their hand raised. Okay, Onario, you you have your hand raised. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like Silly me. <laughs> um, so Marianne, where would I, where should a person start if they wanted to figure out the system dynamics? You know, what'd you start with? So, uh, 
the best option so first of all the the um donna meadows book thinking and systems of primer is really incredibly accessible it's like i said the system dynamics community is mostly policy people rather than computer scientists so it's extremely accessible it's not super technical and it just talks about uh, different types of interactions between stocks and flows, different ways signal systems can misbehave. It really sort of helps. It's interesting and it's helpful sort of conceptualize. Uh, Jay Forrester wrote a bunch of different books. There is a really, really, really old language that Jay Forrester wrote uh, to do this kind of modeling called Dynamo. Uh, unfortunately, this was before the era of open source. It was closed source proprietary and therefore extinct because the company that he uh, put together to, to sell it to people went out of business. So you can't, I mean, I don't know that you'd want to use it even if you could, because uh, it reminds me, it gives me flashbacks to COBOL. Everything is in all caps and like columns, <laughs> columns mean things. Uh, and so I wouldn't do that to you. I would say that, that there are two tools that are available for free that don't do any kind of model checking and are a little bit limiting in their simulation, but are really helpful to getting started. The first is called Loopy, L-O-O-P-Y. And the second is called Insight Maker. Insight Maker is pretty robust in terms of like um, what it will allow you to do and therefore a little overwhelming. The thing for me about both of these tools is that they're both primarily visual, right? Um, Insight Maker generates JavaScript code, and I think you can actually export the JavaScript that it generates, but JavaScript is also not a language that I really would want to do models in, right? Like, <laughs> JavaScript is a great language for the web, but like I don't think of models as being necessarily things on web pages. I think of them as things on desktops, and so I prefer to not have JavaScript, but uh, this, is, this is now branching into editorial. <laughs> <laughs> So in 2021, when you guys have your conference, I'll hopefully have like a beta release of my language and I can come like, then I'll do the live coding because then I'll be prepared. <laughs> I should mention though, I had a friend who's a, a developer evangelist for Twilio back in the day that wrote a shell script that would fake live coding for him because he was so nervous about doing it all the time that he would actually, like, it's like, I'm just going to bang on my keyboard and like they, what they see on the screen is like, looks like I'm live coding. <laughs> I, I feel like I've, I feel like I've heard a few people that do that. Like they literally like make little macros, like boom, boom, you know, as they're it's typing. So looks like, yeah, yeah. It's so stressful. <laughs> I remember Dick Wall was at uh, Code Mash one year, and he used recordings. He said, "I'm not even live coding. Here's a recording. What I'm going to show you." <laughs> Did you know you'll forget like a dot or a semicolon, and you won't see it, and you'll just like the time stretches out. <laughs> 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 the audience will tell you. Yeah. If it's a, if it's a like if it's a group this size, then. So it's a it's a trade off because it's really great keeping an audience engaged, but also like you have to be okay with the audience pointing out your errors. <laughs> sure, I learned long ago not to be embarrassed by you know audience correcting me because like they do it all the time, you know. Yeah, and actually usually they're right, and it's like great, I'm learning something too cool, you know. Agreed. Surely somebody else must have some questions for Marianne. This is an awesome talk. Absolutely. I think everyone's minds is just so blown. <laughs> I'm super intimidating. <laughs> I even had the kids screaming behind me, and I, I still was like, I had both had, you know, the headset going <laughs> on, and I'm just like dialed in. So yeah, it was really great talk. Very interesting topic. I would say if you if you guys are interested in formal methods, the stuff that I was talking about with Cock and uh, TLA Plus and Ally, there is a growing community of people over Twitter that are like super um nice and approachable and like really active in trying to develop more accessible resources for beginners like that that is like everybody feels the pain of like ha what is this stuff um but as soon as you start like connecting with that group of people there they'll just be uh, like i have had people like sit down with me and look at my specs and kind of go like well here's your problem like and then kind of work through it with me which i've never had before in another community which is great Matthew, you got your hand up man so, so I'm, I'm new to all of this and, and thanks for sharing so much. Where, where do you see this fitting in the life cycle of a project? Is it something that somebody is, is really like planning out ahead of time or is it like, oh crud, we've had these problems. Now let's 
see if we can model it and see where the these these source issues are coming from. Yeah, that that is that is my um, career question for my current workplace because like I have wanted for a very long time to sort of start to integrate this stuff more in the software development process. Generally speaking, the people who do this kind of modeling are academics, right? So they're looking to they have a dissertation in which they built a compiler and they need to make sure that it's verified as part of like their their uh, uh, artifacts for their dissertation or they're doing research and they need to like do the proofs for their their research um, which is sad because I think it is is useful like it's one of those things that um, you go slower to move faster right like so it slows things down a little bit in the beginning um, because you have to kind of think more about like what you're building and how you're building and all of the edge cases for it but when if you get good at writing these kind of models then you can execute on them much, much quicker. Uh, I don't have a really great answer for that. I think uh, I prefer to start this when we're building the system as a way of requirements gathering and as a way of keeping multiple engineering teams on the same page. Um, I have frequently found myself in a situation where uh, two teams are building two services that are supposed to integrate with one another and aren't talking to one another about it. And the world of data contracts makes that easier because at least at the very at the very least we know like what we have to honor in terms of those interactions, but doesn't completely fix that problem, right? You can still build a system in which the data that you're providing to a dependent system is arranged in such a way that it is absolutely impossible for them to use it to doing what they're going to do. So um, that's the place where I like to plug it in. And in front of any major changes that we might be planning around the system, but I think it's probably realistically speaking, it's probably going to end up with the same issue we have with documentation, right? Like you want to write it in the beginning, and then the real struggle is keeping it up to date. And I think that the models will probably have a similar effect. Like we'll write them in the beginning when we're super enthusiastic about it, and then we'll make little changes in these tiny commits that make the model out of date in ways that we haven't considered. I think in general, the biggest problem that formal methods has got is that this this false dichotomy a lot of programmers have, like with testing too, it's the same thing. If we can't mm -hmm. test the whole thing, there's no point in testing any of it. Well, yeah. baloney. Even if I can only test 30% of the code, I'm still 30% ahead. And the same thing with formal methods. Yeah, I can't prove the entire system is correct, but if I can prove this one critical function is correct, then I'm gaining something. Yeah. Like, I think people always ask, well, how do I take this model and like create something that automatically compiles to this programming language like Cock does with OCaml? And I do not know that that is as useful as people assume it would be, right? Actually, did you meet Jay at Strange Loop? Jay. Jay Poller. I don't think uh, I did. So Jay Poller is one of the formal methods crew on Twitter. He's fantastic. But what he's done professionally with formal methods, I actually think is a really great approach. Uh, he kind of uses it almost like a red teaming exercise. Like he will sit with teams and kind of say like, okay, tell me about your system. And like, they'll describe their system to him and like, he'll go and he'll spec it out and he'll go and he'll come back and he'll bring this back and he'll go, is this your system? And they'll go, yes. Or they'll say, no, it doesn't behave like that. And he'll refine the model. And then he'll run the model for them and go like, look at this behavior. Is this behavior okay? And they'll be like, oh shit, wait, does it really do that? And then they'll do their own little research and figure out that it really did that. Like he gave a great talk at that strange loop, the 2019 strange loop about doing this at Rackspace on their login system. And uh, basically, uh, completely screwing over the launch schedule because they had to stop a release and go back and like rebuild something from scratch because that he had found a security hole in the system. So I always thought that was a really brilliant approach to integrating formal methods into a dev team is to basically have a team that's kind of going through and saying like, let's talk about your system. Oh, by the way, did you know you can, the, there are, here are all these problems with your system and like, let's verify that these problems are real and then fix them. Yeah, I was going to say, my experience with TLA plus so far has been, and this with formal methods in general, I know what I want to say, I just don't know how to say it. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like it's like learning a foreign language. I know what I'm trying to say. It's in my mind, but getting it out, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, I a hundred percent understand. Um, I I can talk very confidently about it. And then I get with the uh, the crew that comes from like the academic math background and like their Greek. I just I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I, this is the link to Jay's talk from Strange Loop. It's really good. Uh, he was on the, he, he got to be on the big main stage and I teased him because I'm like, that is literally the worst place to demo to present in Strange Loop because unless you're the keynote, it, it always looks empty, right? Cause it, it sits like 3000 people. So you, it doesn't matter how many people show up to your talk it's always going to look like you're speaking to like a third of the room. It's like- but they I mean, put the best talk there in each slot. That's true. This is why it's like super stressful. You don't feel like the best talk. You, I want to I wanna always want to be on one of the, like the side rooms of the opera theater because they, when they fill up, they fill up. And so I feel like that's, that's a good size for me. I don't, never want to be in the opera house, but he did a good job despite that. I had some friends try to do a conference here in Detroit and they did it in a, a big auditorium, which was, you know, would have been fine if they had drawn more than like 70 people because it looks so empty. Yeah. And it's like, and they, you know, it's like, wow, this is a shame. You guys should have done it in a smaller room and had it like overflowing. And then people be, like, wow, this is really popular. You know? Yeah. 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 I said, you know, little, little things, little things matter. Okay. So does anybody else have any other questions for Marianne? Um, I'm, I'm excited about this. Marianne, it turns out that when you get an error in Faultling and then you fix it, the error message doesn't go away. Yeah, I know, I know. I got a oh, list that... of things that I <laughs> <fix> about the <laughs> REPL. <laughs> yeah, that, that threw me. Yeah. You did see that part about pre pre alpha, right, Jessica? It was running <laughs> my system, but it was, but it was totally running it, but I didn't know it because I'm still trying my, to fix it. My apologies. It's like one of those the the downside of deciding to do a podcast at the same time that I'm doing a major yeah. project is that like everything longer. The workload got a little intense towards the end, and so I had this moment of like, yeah. okay, well, I have a list of to dos in my um little git commit repository so uh, right that's that's mm -hmm. when you just put a link to the repo and say make a pr form <laughs> please come fix it i have nothing but mad respect for people who really take open source seriously because they deal with so much garbage so many entitled Especially in jerks October. yeah so um, many act so many entitled jerks and you know and hey you know i you have a typo here why don't you fix it oh you have a typo here <laughs> you know <laughs> okay ah jessica please okay so i'm i'm gonna have to check out insight maker because this is this is like a, a system a, a very simplified system of stocks and flows um that i did by yeah. hand oh neat it, it, it represents the software manager's fantasy <laughs> of um, software development where if if you just click more you get more capabilities and then <laughs> the, the software just magically creates more value <laughs> and also looks like it adds more friends uh everybody's default name is fred um, and there is only one team in this initial application. So all of you are Fred until you change your name and click report. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I saw, I saw um, somebody then, pointed out some meme creator called objection.lol that is apparently based on some anime cartoon that anime cartoon that's redundant anime show that uh is about lawyers and they made a real funny thing you know it's like uh, assertion objection you know it, i'm sorry I'm, I'm butchering it but <laughs> there is nothing that can't be made into a fantastic anime i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> all right so 
thank you, Marianne. That was very informative and entertaining. And I am so glad I asked you to do that for us. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was so much fun. And I hope that when it's safe to travel again, I will definitely be looking to come to the Detroit area and I would love to like connect in person. Yeah. And, like, hang on. Love to for have those you. of you who are in St. Louis, I will definitely be coming to Strange Loop as soon as we can have that in person. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to go down there this year so bad. I, I was craving my toasted ravioli, something terrible. <laughs> I'm looking on the internet. I'm looking at Gold Belly. Is so good. Will deliver me some toasted ravioli. This is not there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, I love, I love coming to St. Louis once a year. So we'll definitely be back in, in St. Louis. And I, I hope to be able to like go on the road very soon. 